our next speaker is Victor Campos. Uh, Victor Campos is a PhD candidate at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And uh, today he's going to present us uh, this uh, Skip RNN work, which uh, was presented at iClear this year. Uh, so, yeah, the floor is yours. Okay, so thanks for the introduction. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to present this paper that was uh, advised by Brendan, Jordi, Xavi, and Shifu. So, usually I would start, uh, well, telling you why working with RNN is important, but I hope that you are convinced already after so many talks today. So, I'm going to the, so to the main motivation of this work, um, which is that RNNs are sequential. I mean, this is good. That's why they can model these temporal dependencies in the data. But at the same time, uh, this may come with some problems, especially when we work with very long sequences. So these problems could be like slow inference because you cannot parallelize computation across time steps. And also during training, you can even uh, find some issues like it's difficult to capture long-term dependencies. And then you can also have things like exploding or vanishing gradients. So let's assume that we cannot change this sequentiality in RNNs. So then we say, okay, maybe what we can do is make these sequences shorter somehow. So if we have the issues when these uh, sequences are long. And we propose to learn this. Okay, so th we don't want to impose any you know, handcrafted strategy like just downsampling your signal. We want to learn this. So imagine, I don't know, that we have a video, you have a sequence of frames. Maybe you can skip some of them and that's fine because you can still understand the video. Uh, but let's learn how to do this because sometimes some frames can be more important than others. And that's the main goal of this work. So what we do is propose a new model that we call the skip RNN. And the main idea is that we can somehow wrap an RNN, okay? So here we have this block S that can be any RNN. So it can be a vanilla RNN, but an LSTM, GRU, whatever you like. And the idea is that we add this additional um, update gate that's binary, zero or one. So whenever this is one, we're gonna perform the regular update to the RNN. When this is zero, we're gonna skip that. We simply copy the hidden state from the previous time step. Okay, so uh, sometimes I get the question of what's the difference between these and things like the input or forget gate in the LSTM. So there are two main differences. First thing, this is scalar, okay? So it's a single value that's shared for the whole hidden state. So you either copy or update the whole thing. And it's also binary, okay? So it's not a sigmoidal output or anything like that. So it's a hard zero or a hard one. Nothing that converges to that like asymptotically. So it's effectively copying the hidden state. So this is the model that we propose. Uh, so you have a bunch of equations here, so I'm gonna guide you through them. So first of all, we have what I was saying before, this binary gate, okay, this is a scalar. And so here what we do is basically implement this if-else statement that we had in the previous slide, but like mathematically. So how do we get this binary gate? We have something else that we call the, the probability for updating that then we binarize. I'm gonna comment on this later. Uh, so we get this probability that in the end it's gonna be a function of the hidden state. So uh, it's something that's gonna accumulate and increase whenever we skip, okay? So say that we skip this step, then it's more likely that we need to update in the next one. Otherwise, whenever we update, we some, uh, sort of reset this accumulated value. Okay, so this is essentially what we are doing in these equations here. And you see that this increment that we add, uh, this is gonna be a function of the current hidden state. Just a sigmoidal output that's being added and added until we update, then we reset it. So I think it's simple to see it this way. So we have basically two operating modes. In one of them we update, which is essentially doing the same as in the basic RNN, so you compute your update, and also you compute this additional scalar output that comes from a sigmoidal layer. And in the copying mode, you see that you copy the hidden state directly from input to output, you don't modify it, and also you don't need your current input. This is interesting because in applications where you have an associated cost to obtaining this input, for example, when you have video task where you need to pre-process your frame, say with a, I don't know, VGG or ResNet uh, CNN, that's very expensive and you can skip that, that part and then you can get huge savings. And also we show that uh, you can completely skip this part actually during inference. So you need this during training 
Um, but at inference, you can only do the updating part and then skip to the next uh, state that you need to update and do not use uh, those inputs that are being uh, skipped. Okay, so there's something else here. It said that I would, uh, I would talk about this uh, binarizing function. So in this case, we use a deterministic rounding function. So whenever this probability is below that five, we round it to zero, otherwise we round it to one. Uh, but this is not, I mean, it's differentiable, but the gradient is null everywhere. So you cannot plug this in into a backprop setting and make it train. So what we use is the, uh, what's called the strict estimator, which essentially tells you, okay, do your regular forward pass, but in the backward pass, I compute the gradients as if you had done the identity operation here. So it's a bias estimator, but seems to work well in practice, and it has been used in other papers and works well. So with this, we can train already our model, but we add something else. Uh, and we add an additional loss term here, uh, which is gonna encourage the net to use more or less uh, updates. So without this, you can already train the model, but I mean, you're not telling it, okay, use as few samples as you can, right? So with this, it's something similar to like wake decay, where you are sort of regularizing the net, to trying to you know, solve the task, but at the same time, with as few samples as possible, so as, may, as few updates as possible. And I think this related to something that Jose Alvarez said before, that usually during training, you can have these huge data centers, so you don't care if you need to do many updates, but then when you want to do inference, maybe you have to do that on your laptop, on your smartphone, so with this lambda, you can tune how many uh, updates you're gonna perform and find different you know, operating points for your net. So I'm gonna comment on some experiments that we performed. First of them is on MNIST. So just take the MNIST images and flatten them into these long vectors with almost 800 pixels and give the pixels one at a time to the RNN. And these are the results that we get. Okay, so you see that we evaluate on LSTM and GRU. So very quickly here, um, so we have like three lines for every model, the baseline LSTM, let's say. Then we train the skip LSTM and we see that first, uh, we get better accuracy rates in the end using around half of the samples. And we say, okay, maybe this is because we're simply, you know, skipping things, optimization is easier. So we train a ba another baseline, which is the LSTM that skips more or less the same number of pixels as the skip LSTM. Uh, but we see that then this gets uh, uh, less accuracy. So there's accuracy drop here because you're somehow breaking, I guess, this representation, this good representation in the sequence. Okay, so this is something that we see also for the GRU. Um, and then we, what's nice about MNIST is that we can visualize what's going on so here I'm showing in red the pixels that are being used and in blue the ones that are being skipped. And you see that more or less uh, this sort of makes sense. I mean, it's focusing on some of the different parts of the, of the digits. This is different for every input, so it's not like, you know, constant for any input. And we also observe that this changes during training, which is what we wanted, to let the network tune these sort of masks that it's learning. And then we move on to something a bit more complex, which is action localization on video. So we have input sequences and also output sequences. So the net is, um, is asked to give for every single frame, like a vector with all the possible classes and telling, okay, this class is present in this frame or not. Um, so we pre-process every frame with a VGG net. So that's the most expensive part of the of the whole pipeline. So whenever we, we can skip, uh, as you were saying at the beginning, whenever we can skip one frame, we skip also the CNN part, so we get huge savings. So here I'm showing very similar, uh, like same kind of experiments as in MNIST, but here we also changed lambda to different values. So that's why we can get different points in this. So the horizontal axis, that's the floating point operations, number of floating point operations so the uh, computational cost of the model, and then the vertical axis is the like, mean, average, mean average precision in the task. So uh, generally what we see is that, first, surprisingly maybe, um, when you randomly skip some frames, you can even get some improvements, like in the GRU, uh, the, the right plot, you see that you can use fewer flops, fewer updates, and you can even increase the results. And I think that's because video is so redundant that when you use this uh, 
CNNs with max pooling, you're essentially getting the same number or the same kind of features for the frames. So that's why this doesn't make a difference to the net. It's not missing anything. But when you go to the leftmost region of the plot, so when you use very few frames, very few uh, floating point operations, so notice that this is logarithmic, so the leftmost points are using like 10% of the frames only, the gap is larger. So the orange triangles, that's uh, our models, uh, are performing much better than the baselines. Because then it becomes very, very important to learn which frames you need to use, which ones you can skip. Um, okay. um, so we evaluated these on many other tasks. So I showed only a couple of them here due to the lack of time. Uh, but what I wanted to show with this slide is that we tried synthetic tasks where you need to do classification, but also for regression. I mean, this is not suited only for one kind of loss function, for example, but also with different sources uh, of data, okay? So we had the synthetic data, we had images, text, we tried different experiments with video. I think that some people had also extended this for speeds now, they have used the, the code which is open. Um, so in general, I would say that whenever you have some task, sequential task, where you think that the signal might have some redundancy, I think it's worth trying this. I mean, it's not like something we tailored for very specific tasks, but we show that it somehow works for many of them. And also you have the project side uh, online, you have the paper that was published at clear this last year, and you also have the code in TensorFlow. And that's everything from my side, thank you. So, questions? Uh, uh, thank you for the talk. Can you el elaborate more about using this uh, model for text, especially if you have a short uh, sentence, <coughs> or you try to make it shorter, and you miss the most impor important information that isn't there? Yeah, um, so we had some experiments on text. I don't think that's like the best application for this. Because, uh, as you were saying text, I'm not that sure it's so redundant. I mean, maybe you can skip some words, but it's very risky. Maybe you skip some of them that are very important and then you miss the whole meaning of the sentence. So in our experiments, we did it with sentiment analysis on IMDB. Um, but I think that in that kind of setup also, back of words uh, models work very well. So, you know, maybe you don't need to see all the words, but in things like language models, for instance, I would not use it. I don't think that's like the best task for these kind of models. We have time for one more. No? Okay, then in the sake of brevity, let's thank the speaker again. And